morning, John Barson here, Total Health Magazine, Total Health Television. Joining me this morning, uh, luckily for us, for our viewers, our readers, uh, Jeffrey Smith, the founder and president. Uh, executive director. Executive director of the Institute for Responsible Technology. Happens to be in Los Angeles, so I, I grabbed him for a, for, a, for a bit of a session here. Uh, lucky for us, you're just here for the day. That's right. Uh, where are you based, Jeffrey? I'm in Bay Area right now, and I sort of do time in, in Iowa as well. Okay, terrific. Now, I was reading, uh, this will probably make you feel good, I was reading the Mercola thing this morning on the top 50 worst charities in the country. And uh, it's, it's amazing, the, the, the hundreds of millions of dollars, charities raising mil tens and tens of millions of dollars and giving 0.5%. All right, so that means if you want to give money to a charity, give it to the Institute for Responsible Technology because we turn the money into non-GMO gold. <laughs> the segue, thank you for that. Uh, sure, no problem. <laughs> the segue nice was that at the conclusion of the article, Mercola uh -huh. listed the top 10 recommended charities. Uh -huh. And you're on the list. All right. I didn't know that. Yes, yes. So it's official on the list this morning. Mercola's, All right, we made you, it. You, we made it to the top 10. You made it to the top 10. All right. Now let's talk about the Institute for Responsible Technology. How did you get started? Well, I started in 2003. I had already been working on the GMO issue for seven years, but that was the year I came out with the book Seeds of Deception and started traveling around the world and building uh, international influence. And so we needed a way to take the energy and motivation that we were creating and channel it into the most effective way to stop GMOs. The mission of the Institute is to end GMOs in food and to stop the outdoor release of GMOs. We don't want to stop biotechnology. We don't want to eliminate the possibility of correcting defective genes in a human, uh, but we don't want it to be spread in the food supply or spread in the environment, especially now because the technology is prone to unpredicted side effects. It's not, it's a leaky technology. And so when you create, for example, Monsanto's corn that produces a toxic insecticide, which is bad in one hand, you also turn on a gene in corn that produces an allergen, so people might get an allergic reaction, even die from one of these unpredicted uh, side effects of the technology. And this is not being evaluated and protected. Uh, and so the entire population, everyone who eats, and then because it's in the environment, it can cross-pollinate all living beings and all future generations because it's passed on in the gene pool, all of that is at risk. So we decided that um, we wanted to eliminate GMOs, not just contain their growth, not just eliminate the new GMOs being introduced, but to eliminate GMOs altogether. Right. So we did a strategic analysis and we have a particular strategy and it's working. So you think that uh, like right now uh, the majority of Americans are in favor of GMO labeling, but there's a very large groundswell of support for eliminating GMOs. And if you look at labeling, I and mean, obviously we're in favor of labeling, 64 other countries have labeling. However, we don't require labeling in order to eliminate GMOs. Uh, and here's why. We saw in Europe, there was a lot of coverage on the health dangers of GMOs back in 1999. A friend of mine now, not then, uh, one of the top scientists in the world in his field discovered that GMOs were dangerous. He had been given money by the UK government to figure out how to test for the safety of GMOs. He was a pro-GMO scientist, much to his surprise. Within 10 days, rats had massive damage to organs and systems because of the process of genetic engineering. He was fired from his job after his discovery, silenced with threats of a lawsuit, defamed, etc. When his gag order was lifted by an order of parliament, over 700 articles were written within a month about GMOs in the UK alone, and many more uh, in, throughout Europe, but not in the United States. It was the overwhelming concern by the readers and listeners to those news reports that forced the food industry within 10 weeks of the gag order being lifted to eliminate GMOs. They, starting on April 27th, 1999, Unilever said, no more GMOs in Europe. In Europe. And then in Nestle, Europe. in Europe, not the United States, where Project Censor described the whole event as one of the 10 most underreported events of the year. The next day, Nestle's, the next week, everyone else. So that was a tipping point of consumer rejection, which has kept GMOs out of McDonald's and Burger King and Nestle's and Unilever, et cetera, in Europe. Then we saw a tipping point in the United States against bovine growth hormone, the genetically engineered drug introduced by Monsanto that is linked to cancer. And it was kicked out of Walmart, Starbucks, Yoplait, Dan, and most American dairies. 
and it was not required to be labeled. So how did it work? It was the voluntary labeling of the companies that say no RBST or no RBGH or no artificial hormones. They were getting more customers. And so the people that were still using the hormones said, oh my God, we're losing market share. We have to stop using it. It's not worth it. They changed it. They eliminated it. We saw a, a elimination of GMOs largely from the natural products industry, a tipping point in 2013. Whole Foods said when a product becomes verified non-GMO, it increases sales by 15 to 30 percent. As soon as they made that statement, <clears throat> and they were going to label it in 2018, but immediately hundreds of companies enrolled because they didn't want their competitors to steal that 15 to 30 percent. That's a significant percentage, 15 Huge. to 30 percent. Huge. So we tipped the natural products industry against GMOs in 2013. And now 58 percent of Americans are seeking, are looking for non-GMO foods, according to the Hartman Group. Now, 58% is 184 million people. Now, not everyone is actively looking, not everyone is rejecting things that contain GMOs, but they're looking for it. Now, if we can take the people who are already convinced, gently or otherwise, and give them more reason to avoid it, and teach them how, we win. Because, because GMOs offer no consumer benefit, there's no compelling reason why someone says, oh, I'm going to eat the, I'm going to eat the GMO in the morning and wake up for my, my dose of Roundup herbicide and the Roundup Ready soybeans and my dose of BT toxin and BT corn. It's not like trans fats where it creates a mouthfeel where you, some people offer trans fats and some don't. It's not like high doses of sugar which have this other appeal. There's no consumer appeal. So if a company is losing market share to a competitor sitting on the shelf just because that competitor has non-GMO on the label, the, the first one is going to just eliminate it in order to right. protect themselves. And even if it's not their immediate competitor, even if they see in other aspects of the industry that same dynamic playing out, we win. So our elimination strategy does not depend on Washington, D.C., does not depend on the Obama administration, does not depend on state labeling initiatives, it does not de depend on state legislators, it does not depend on courts, it does not even depend on new scientific evidence because we have enough scientific evidence to demonstrate to the average person that there's no logical reason for them to put this stuff in their mouths given what we know about what happens to the rats, what happens to the mice, what happens to the pets, what happens to the livestock, and what happens to, the, to, uh, to all the different research studies and laboratories and also now Thousands of doctors are prescribing non-GMO diets and million, many millions more are describing getting better from certain diseases and disorders. So we haven't obviously spoken to millions, but we've spoken to a sampling of them. I sent out a survey uh, and got 3,600 responses of people who describe what they got better from when they stopped eating GMOs and switched to non-GMO or organic. So <clears throat> we have a, a very strong case now that we make that will really drive people to non-GMO eating. Well, it seems to me that the only, when you talk about, you know, or ask the question, what's the appeal? It seems to me that, especially in all these campaigns that Monsanto and the, the cadre of um, biotech food companies uh, seem to, the message they seem to constantly put out there is support GMOs because we're going to feed the world. Yeah. That's the only, it seems to me that's the only. It's one of the main lies. It's of several it's, lies. One is that it's safe, one that it's, uh, it's well regulated, one that it'll increase yields, one that it'll reduce agricultural chemicals, and that it'll feed the world. These are the primary lies. Now, we know they're lies, and I'll give you, I'll, to back up what I'm saying, I'm going to give you the, the evidence here. Um, the United Nations and the World Bank and many other international organizations sponsored the most comprehensive evaluation of agriculture and food in terms of how to feed the world in the future. And they had over 400 scientists, the best in the field, the best academics, et cetera. And they published a report uh, recently, a few years ago, uh, called the ISTAD report, I-A-A-S-T-D. And they determined that GMOs have nothing to offer, nothing to offer to feed the hungry world, eradicate poverty, or create sustainable agriculture. The co-chairman of the report said it's basically a um, solution looking for a problem. It doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't fit any of the problems that they're looking for. It, it, it doesn't increase yield. According to the USDA, according to the uh, Union of Concerned Scientists, according to independent research all over the country, it does not increase yield and often reduces yield. It concentrates the power of and, agriculture. And, sorry, and in California, which is this is also important, <coughs> contrary to what they would like us to believe, it takes more water. Oh, yeah. Way more water to grow a GMO crop than a non-GMO crop. It takes more water and 
Um, it kills the this, most GMOs are engineered. The genes are taken in from bacteria or viruses or both, and it allows the plant to be sprayed with an herbicide. So most 80% of the GMOs out there are engineered to be sprayed with Roundup herbicide, Monsanto's herbicide, active ingredient glyphosate. And the glyphosate kills the beneficial bacteria in the soil, compacts the soil, so when it does rain, not, even though the plants require more water, not as much water goes into the soil, and so there's runoff. So it contributes to flooding, erosion, uh, and also uh, sucks up the water and makes the water less, less effective in terms of agriculture. And not to mention it poisons the land. Oh, yeah, and it and can the stay, water it and can the stay in the soil the, the longest reported half-life, which means the time it takes for it to degrade 50% was 22 years. Now, it's usually quicker than that, it's, but, but sometimes under certain soil conditions, It'll take decades for it to go away. Well, we're talking, I mean, what's the volume globally, though, like in Argentina and, and all these, and I, the U.S.? I mean, what's the volume of Roundup going into our waters and oceans, into our lakes and streams? Millions and millions of pounds. I don't have the exact number, but, um, I mean, the amount of herbicide in general that has uh, increased over the first 16 years because of these herbicide-tolerant crops was 527 million pounds, and that's just the increase. So we have a situation now where that Roundup, that glyphosate active ingredient, has been implicated in a number of diseases. Um, in fact, when people stop eating GMOs and switch to organic to get rid of the Roundup, we see uh, reversal of autism, and I'm saying reversal of autism. I'm saying it, it's in a film we're creating called Secret Ingredients. Go to secretingredientsmovie.com, you can see the trailer. We have three autistic kids featured in that one. Um, diabetes. Um, cancers, um, ADHD, gastrointestinal disorders, skin problems, depression, um, migraines, all these things. Uh, long, long list. Now, when you look at the action of glyphosate alone and the Roundup, it explains all these things, including obesity or difficulty losing weight, um, anxiety, mental conditions. Roundup is a chelator. It binds with minerals, making them unavailable. And when you cut off the availability of certain trace minerals, you block certain metabolic pathways. So the metabolic pathway in the gut that produces the building blocks for serotonin, melatonin, and dopamine, they can become scarce. Without enough serotonin or melatonin and dopamine, there's a whole series of mental disorders, blood sugar problems, obesity, um, Parkinson's, sleep disorders, depression, etc. It also blocks another pathway that helps the liver detox. So if you aren't able to detox as effectively, all the other poisons in the environment can be amplified that are normally detoxed through that pathway. It blocks the production of vitamin D. It's an endocrine disruptor, so it can dis create a disbalance of the sexual hormones as well as other hormones. It's a probable human carcinogen, according to the World Health Organization. It's an antibiotic, and it kills the beneficial gut bacteria. And as you probably know, when you kill the beneficial gut bacteria, the negative stuff can overgrow. That's called dysbiosis. And when that happens, a whole bunch of gastrointestinal disorders are related, as well as autism and a whole bunch of Alzheimer's and a whole bunch of diseases, in part because with that dysbiosis, it creates something called zonulin, which creates holes in the walls of the intestines. Right. So you have leaky gut. Well, you know, it, you're talking about all this. Again, when you're on the web and you're reading, you know, blogs and people are posting things and you see responses and you can tell the the responses from the people that are working on behalf of. Oh yeah, the, the trolls the trolls, number. There's huge number huge of those trolls. Of them. Yeah. Um, one of the uh, you see this all the time. You'll see somebody post a great some great information, some new research, negative research in regards to GMOs, and then somewhere down there you'll start to see things like. Well, we've been eating GMOs for 25 years, and, and there's you know nothing's wrong. Wait a minute, nothing's wrong. Let me explain the. Let me respond <laughs> to that. If you look at the work by Nancy Swanson um, on the web about glyphosate, she's a physicist and she's worked with some of these biologists and scientists. At MIT. And, no, Swanson's not, but Stephanie Seneff is oh, from Stephanie, MIT. She right, works right. there with her too. You look at the. Uh, they just correlated the use of GMOs and the and the use of Roundup on GMOs with a number of diseases. There's over 20. And if you look at them, there's seven or eight types of cancer, there's autism. It just, the, the rise in autism matches the rise in the use of Roundup, the rise in diabetes, the rise in um, inflammatory bowel disease, in uh, uh, ADHD, in anemia, schizophrenia, 
um, deaths from strokes, deaths from senile dementia, deaths from high blood pressure, deaths from obesity, kidney failure, hepatitis C, and that and that's not all of them. Um, there's a lot more, and we believe. I mean, the fact that they move in parallel does not prove causation. Correlation does not prove causation. We believe there is causation. We believe that there is um, a reason why when Roundup goes up, a lot of these diseases go up because it has all these modes of action in the body. Um, and I just got through some of them. It also helps damage the mitochondria. The mitochondria, when it's damaged, can right. lead to all sorts of diseases as well as brain fog and low energy and, and chronic fatigue. Um, there's so many, and we're, we're analyzing these in our new film, Secret Ingredients, which will be out in 2016. So um, I was just at a medical conference, and one of the presenters gave a lecture and talked about glyphosate, the active ingredient in Roundup, as the toxin for the, for the practitioners to look at, that it was the, the, one of the most important problems we're facing in the United States and around the world. With this trail of destruction, uh, how, did my, how, did, how, did, how was it approved in the first place? Well, this is a story uh, that very quickly paints the picture of our government. Um, the White House had told the FDA to promote GMOs because they thought it would increase U.S. exports and increase U.S. domination of world food trade. So this was the first Bush White House. So they told the FDA, and the FDA created a position for Michael Taylor, Monsanto's attorney, to become the chief policy person at the FDA while the GMO policy was being created. So he was in charge of all policy. He's the one that allowed their genetically engineered bovine growth hormone on the market. His policy said GMOs don't have to be tested. They don't have to be labeled. Companies like Monsanto, who told us that Agent Orange, PCBs, and DDT were safe, could put GMOs in the market.